My father really intended to be here until about a week ago. He, he came down with a, an ulcer. But uh, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be at these other meetings. Uh, it's just a temporary glitch. Uh, so he is, my father is uh, Gilbert Levin. He's one of the uh, principal investigators on the Viking biology mission from 1976. Now, there have been many landers since Viking, including the latest being Curiosity, but none of them has had an explicit uh, biological life detection experiment since the uh, three life detection experiments in 1976. And uh, I've been following it, not in an official capacity, for uh, probably about well, since 1962, so that's uh, 50 years. And uh, I'm, I'm quite familiar with a lot of the history of it. And when you look at the whole thing, I, f I feel it's quite clear that there is uh, microbial life, which, by which I think I mean algae and yeast, or uh, the same sort of uh, organisms that you see in the early Earth fossil record from four billion years ago uh, on the surface of Mars today, or at least in 1976. And uh, my father's been trying to get them to explicitly look for an extant life since that time, and uh, I'm sure one day he'll be successful, and uh, there's a follow-on experiment at the very end of this talk that would really clear up the question but the, and this is something I just, I came across. This is a picture from the Viking era of um, a day when it's snowed. That is to say, that white stuff is not dry ice, it's not frozen carbon dioxide, but it's actually frozen water. And you know the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. The last speaker said, you've got carbon dioxide and if you've got water, uh, you're you have a good chance of having life, and those are both present here. Lots of sunlight, and uh, this, uh, what I call snow, NASA calls condensate. Um, <laughs> this uh, stayed there for about 30 days in the in the coldest part of the winter. This is Viking Lander too, and uh, it. It eventually either sublimed or melted and then evaporated. Since it's more than the triple point of water, uh, we are, you know, we have a, a very good chance that it converted into liquid phase. And even a few molecular layers of liquid water is enough if you go to dry valleys of Antarctica and so on, and other extreme places on Earth. So, um, this is really the, the lowest level of line. In other words, if you want to ask yourself if there was microbial life on Mars, what's, what's the least thing that it would mean? And it, it would mean that it, it could have come from the Earth. And uh, there have been meteors on Earth that were discovered in the Antarctic. I mean, meteors from Mars that were discovered in the Antarctic the famous Allen Hills meteorite, had left uh, Mars 16 million years ago, went through various orbital maneuvers, and, and landed on Earth about 4,000 years ago. And uh, there's continual traffic in both directions since both planets are about 4 billion years old. A few million here and there are not much. It turns out that a lot of ordinary microorganisms sporify uh, microorganisms were found on the, on the moon on Surveyor by uh, astronauts from Apollo 12. The uh, microorganisms from Earth survived being on the moon 12 years before the astronauts brought back some pieces of that spacecraft. And they found that those organisms were perfectly viable and they went right on and reproduced. So 12 years in space is not damaging. and. Uh, there's an experiment on the International Space Station, the same thing's going on. They have microorganisms outside the space station 
and they've kept them there several years, and they revive. Um, and in many cases, uh, you can get on your meteor to a very cold temperature, and these things, it's probably like dunking them in liquid nitrogen. They, uh, they just uh, are freeze dried and they can last a long time. They can be revived. These might, many common microorganisms can be revived in good conditions and they will go ahead and reproduce every half an hour. They will double. So if you can imagine one single organism <coughs> landing on Mars or one single organism landing on Earth doubling every half an hour, uh, you know, you can populate the planet in, I think, a few years. So, um, and there are people who have done experiments where they actually put microorganisms on bullets and crashed them into walls and they were able to culture them after afterwards. That is to say, you know, large shocks don't seem to kill them, not all of them. And, uh, and really, I've been following my dad for, uh, you know, 50 years in this business, and I've come to get the feeling that um, life on both planets has a good chance of having come in from some other place. Uh, not that it came from Earth to Mars or went from Mars to Earth, but uh, the fossil record shows a very clear path of evolution, starting with uh, yeast and blue-green algae. But those are very complicated organisms, and of course, Four billion years ago, there's nothing, you know, there's no further record. The record just ends when the when the planet Earth was formed. The universe is supposed to be 14 billion, so there's 10 billion years of potential life that is not recorded in our fossil record. That's beyond the scope here, but in any case, um, there are meteor impacts that could easily exchange Earth-like organisms in either direction. And uh, over four billion years, it's not hard to imagine um, that type of contact. Now, people used to think that life would have had to evolve separately on Mars. And I suppose that's a less probable thing. But uh, I think you'll see, I think that it's not unlikely that they really all came from the same sort of uh, interplanetary sneeze or that there's, you know, there's bacteria floating around in uh, the general solar system and possibly a much larger area. Now, the whole experiment began because my father worked at the public health service, which was responsible for checking uh, the drinking water for uh, e mostly E. coli bacteria. And so, if you have um, you have uh, the wrong type of uh, uh, infection in the water supply, uh, it can be delivering E. coli, and uh, that's a very serious thing. So every water plant has a test, and what it, what it amounts to is taking a sample of water and putting in some uh, nutrients, basically sugars, and allowing the water to sit for a couple of days, and you look for carbon dioxide bubbles, which is similar to the process in, in bread when uh, yeast produces carbon dioxide. Uh, all animals and uh, life that, uh, that uses sugar and uh, takes in oxygen and sugar and it makes uh, carbon dioxide and bacteria are no different. And bacteria in bread uh, put out great amounts of carbon dioxide. So at the water plant, it would take a couple of days before you could actually see enough carbon dioxide to, um, to see the bubbles and declare that the water was not safe to drink. And that was a real problem because uh, you needed to know right away. You needed to have, you know, a couple of hour type of test. And uh, so about that time in the 50s, uh, they were experimenting with radioactive tracers and uh, they set up an experiment to detect the carbon dioxide but much more rapidly because the nutrients um, were labeled with radioactive carbon-14 and uh, you can, you know, since a 
since a mole is 10 to the 26 uh, atoms, you know, a gram of carbon-14 is a tremendous amount of radioactivity. So a, uh, it's, it, a small amount of carbon-14 can be detected very sensitively. Now, um, in the 50s, the Miller-Urey Nobel Prize winning experiment was performed that showed how uh, several basic uh, amino acids and sugars and some, uh, some sparks could come together to produce many more complicated biological chemicals. And it was felt that that was possibly how life started, uh, a combination of these more simple molecules and, and uh, possibly lightning. So uh, the test on Mars was designed by taking uh, sugars like uh, glycine and uh, lactate. These are a little, they're sort of like, I think fructose works also, and glucose, uh, but they made a, a choice to take a sample of those and some amino acids, the Miller-Urey compounds, and that became the uh, nucleus of the uh, radioactive tracer test that ultimately was sent uh, in 1976 to Mars. And um, the idea was to keep it very gentle. These are uh, low concentrations, and they are, um, they are labeled very, uh, at a very low level of radioactivity. So it's not supposed to be, not supposed to be damaging. Now, the, the two lines on this plot, one's called wet and one is called moist. Now the wet one, is basically the experiment I described, where they would take a, a, like a test tube sized volume of water and they put some soil in it and uh, radioactive nutrients, radioactive labeled compounds, and they'd wait for the radioactive, excuse me, um, the um, the wet one is the other line, the, the low line line. They wait for it to uh, produce radioactive gas. Now, it turns out that in that test tube, um, there's exponential growth of these bacteria, and they're putting out carbon dioxide all the time, but it takes a while for the carbon dioxide is initially dissolved in that volume of water, and after the concentration gets too high, it starts bubbling out in you know, tiny microscopic bubbles that can be detected by their radioactivity. But uh, my father um, decided to just try dropping some of the um, radioactive compounds on the soil on Earth. And it would um, produce this much more rapid response. And what I think happens is that as the uh, radioactive uh, food spreads out through the sand, um, the uh, moment that there is water and nutrition, uh, organisms begin to metabolize it. And, and since it's in a much smaller volume of water, the gas gets out of solution and starts uh, bubbling up uh, very quickly. And uh, as you'll see, in about four hours, you get a complete uh, response from the what's actually called the moist method, where you drop this on uh, you drop the substrate directly on the soil, and so that is how the uh, actual test was designed. The uh, flight instrument that landed on the surface of Mars took in um, half a cubic centimeter of soil from a very complicated arm that dropped it in. Um, it was kept slightly higher pressure than uh, the surface of Mars. Surface, okay, the surface of Earth is about a thousand millibars of pressure. The surface of Mars is around, depending on the altitude, 10 millibars of pressure. So the atmospheric pressure of Mars is 1% the atmospheric pressure of Earth. Now this experiment was kept in 85 millibars, which is eight times the pressure on Mars, but still only you know a fraction of the pressure, eight percent of the Earth's pressure. So the idea of it was um, just to make sure that there was no boiling going on 
of uh, the media, just to add enough, a small amount of extra pressure. The um, nutrient was injected with the labeled radioactive carbon, and um, it would turn into gas, and um, I, guess I, I guess I should figure this out. It would turn into gas, and uh, it would go around that baffle, and the baffle was there to stop uh, direct radioactivity. Carbon-14 is a beta emitter. It emits uh, high-energy electrons, and uh, those high-energy electrons go through the air, but they, they're stopped by that thing that's called the baffle. So a radioactivity that's actually in the soil does not reach the detector. But if there's carbon-14 gas, that gas will uh, diffuse throughout the volume of uh, air, or actually helium, and it will get to the detector, and, um, and the detector will record radioactivity. So uh, anything in the soil that would be able to disconnect uh, carbon and turn it into uh, carbon-14 dioxide gas would be detected as um, a living organism, a living microorganism. Uh, so, as a young child, I remember many, many tests of this experiment that were performed on Earth. They went to uh, the top of White Mountain in California. They went to uh, Death Valley and uh, they had the experiments sent to the dry valleys of Antarctica. And the tests on Earth all looked like this plot. Um, the radioactive nutrient would be uh, dropped onto the soil, and within you know, four or eight hours, uh, a very strong positive response would come into being. Now, part of the experiment was uh, what's called the control. And uh, there, there was a lot of thought about the control. And on Earth, a number of times the control was provided by like an antibacterial spray, or, you know, an antiseptic or something. They, they poison with like alcohol or something. Uh, they'd absolutely poison the sample, a duplicate sample, and run it. But most often they came up with the idea of heat sterilization, which is what they do in the hospital with your bed linens and so on, or with the instruments anyway. So um, a duplicate set of soil would be heated to uh, 160 degrees centigrade, where 100 degrees is boiling, for four hours, and you would get essentially no response. So it's not. Uh, it's not as if uh, some very harsh chemical was uh, attacking the substrate. The, uh, you know, the control shows you that whatever you had was deactivated by basically boiling. And that rules out a huge variety of chemicals because uh, harsh chemicals like sulfuric acid or or acetone, all uh, survive 160 degrees centigrade. They need to be heated to a much higher temperature to be destroyed. So this, um, this formed the basis of the test on Earth. It was sent to, I don't know, something like 50 different locations, and it never showed a false negative. They put uh, moon dust on it from the astronauts' return mission and it, did, it showed that it was completely sterile, and they tested many other <coughs> sterile samples, and I'm saying like uh, hundreds, maybe a thousand different types of living and sterile um, uh, soils, and there was never a false positive and never a false negative. <coughs> My father came to conclude that the test was sensitive to about 10 metabolizing organisms. That is, you know, uh, 10 organisms you could see on a microscope if you were so lucky as to find them. <laughs>
would uh, set off this detector. Now, as this was developed in uh, 75, 1970, well, actually, excuse me, 73 maybe, um, they wanted a mock-up on Earth, and this is called the Test Standards Module. That's a gentleman named Bruce Connor who was the technician who ran it most of the time. Now, the test standard module has sort of the, the actual flight uh, conditions on one end, but instead of having the fancy microcomputer and all the flight equipment, it's got ordinary lab equipment on the other. So it's supposed to be the laboratory equivalent of the actual flight uh, tested hardware. And so before launch, they wanted to make sure that the instrument that TRW was building would actually replicate the experimental results that had been done in the lab that I had been telling you about a few minutes earlier. So um, they went back after they built uh, this mock-up, and they have a bell jar over it, and it, it uh, depressurizes the thing to the usual 85 millibars so that it's at the same pressure and it's uh, Martian temperature and so forth. Um, they took many samples of soil, and this one is called Aiken soil from California. And uh, the flight instrument performed just as well as all the laboratory experiments. And uh, the flight instrument was then bound up into this tiny miniaturized marvel that was flown to Mars. Now, the um, life detection experiment is over here on uh, the side closest to me. And my father's was the label release experiment. And Norm Horowitz uh, built the pyrolytic release experiment, or he was the investigator for it. And then gas exchange experiment was uh, run by Vance Oyama. And uh, I have to say that none of the other two experiments ever showed predictive value on the Earth. I guess um, the pyrolytic release experiment showed a, res a small response to a uh, sample of pure algae, concentrated algae. But uh, as far as looking at hundreds of samples, Neither one of the other two experiments showed any predictive value on Earth, but they felt that they were looking for a type of life that was not on Earth, that Mars could have other types of organisms that we had never seen, and those experiments went anyway. But if you're at least willing to consider the possibility that the solar system has some transport of uh, Earth-like organisms, you have to say that an experiment that's well tested to work on Earth, and it's being used today in hospitals for uh, quick uh, identification of bacteria, con you know, contamination, uh, that it was a good thing that they sent my father's experiment to Mars. And on the far side is um, the organic analysis experiment that also went, which was to look through the soil for organic material and it's a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, which uh, means that uh, any organics float through an uh, atmosphere, and the rate at which they float through it depends on uh, the temperature and the molecular weight of each, of each sample. So um, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer was supposed to see if there were dead organisms, like um, you know, fossil fuels like oil, I suppose, in some sense. But if the soil had even a small amount on Earth, uh, that's usually the case. Your rich uh, farming soils have a lot of organic material. But on Mars, this experiment never showed any organic material above background. Uh, absolute zero. Now, this also was the case for a few soils from Antarctica. A few soils tested positive on the labeled release experiment, but still had no organics. 
So that sets the scene for the actual mission to Mars, except I've told you in advance that no organics were found. Now, this is the first set of results. And I was personally fortunate enough to be in Pasadena when this came in. Uh, and this shows that uh, within four hours after the beginning of the experiment, uh, Viking uh, lander number one had emitted a substantial amount of radioactive carbon consistent with life. So the experiment went on for probably about two weeks. Uh, these are sols on the x-axis, which are just a little longer than days because Mars rotates a little bit slower than the Earth. So the next thing they did, oh, excuse me, next thing they did was they ran a um, control. They took an identical sample of soil which had uh, been obtained by the arm. They sterilized it to 160 degrees centigrade, which it's like an autoclave. Yeah, it's like um, boiling water plus a few degrees for four hours. Re-injected uh, the uh, labeled the compounds, and they got no response. The control, the heat sterilized control, showed the absence of whatever it was that caused the active cycle. So um, this shows uh, what happened a little later on. Uh, there was something that they used to do, and this caused a great deal of controversy, called the second injection. After a while, um, which looks like about uh, eight days, they would inject another sample of media, and uh, what happened was that the radioactive level went down, but all that really meant was that the extra liquid was able to absorb some of the CO2. Uh, faster than the organisms were still making carbon dioxide. So there was much talk. The reason that I'm showing the second injection is because there was a lot of talk about uh, did this mean the machine was broken or something like that. Ultimately, there were many similar cases on Earth like the Antarctic soil. It seems to have something to do with having a relatively low number of organisms, but um, if the organisms are not there in sufficient quantity to make gas faster than it's being absorbed in the second injection. So the first thing that happened was that the scientists there complained about the second injection. But uh, over the years, the fact that there wasn't additional gas involved hasn't really been seen to be an important uh, problem with the data. They went back after the second cycle to, um, to run the third cycle, just like the first. They said, well, we'll see if uh, it was a fluke. So they would exactly duplicate the first experiment. And they got even more radioactivity, which probably doesn't matter. But it looked, it looked just like the cycle one, strong release of radioactive gas. Then. Uh, they didn't feel like it was worthwhile to run the control again. So they took soil and they, um, they left it in a, uh, something like four weeks. Oh, it was stored for 141 days at temperatures between 10 degrees and 26 degrees, which is kind of cold room temperature. Uh, like 10 degrees is like uh, 45 degrees Fahrenheit and 26 degrees is like 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just the ambient temperature on the surface of Mars during the experiment. At any rate, after 141 days in the storage unit, uh, there was no response, uh, as if everything were dead. So you should look at all this data from Viking Lander 1 and say, you know, reliably, we get a response when we run the active experiment, and heat sterilization and long-term storage kills the response, could it be anything other than life? A 4,000 miles away, Viking Lander 2 came down, and it gave that curve. That was the active curve. 
strong radioactive release. And uh, they decided to heat the uh, sterilized sample only up to 50 degrees. So um, rather than 160 degrees, which certainly kills the response, they only went to uh, 50 degrees, which I don't know, what do you think? It's like 100, 160 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. And what that did was it reduced the uh, radioactive gas by about 90%. So these uh, radioactive tracings are on a much bigger scale than the previous one. And so a 50 degree sterilization killed most of the organisms, possibly, or we think, possibly not all. And this is a standard test, for instance, when they're looking for the famous E. coli bacteria in the water supply, they often did heat it up to slightly different temperatures, and E. coli was known for being uh, something like 48 degrees centigrade was its uh, fatal temperature. So um, the fact that different organisms didn't exactly die off at the same temperature was reassuring. So, um, what happened uh, next was they, they did cycle three. Cycle two. Uh, not their cycle three. Cycle three was another active, and it was, um, these are all the cycles together. Cycle three was a soil sample that was underneath the rock. Now about this time with the mission, they were getting the feeling that there was some strong oxidizing agent, they thought maybe even peroxide uh, on the soil. And they thought maybe that there was strong ultraviolet light that would kill off any organisms. So they reached underneath of a rock uh, where there shouldn't be any peroxide because uh, because it's not in the sunlight. The strong sunlight is not under the rock. And it had just as good of a positive response as uh, regular soil. And cycle four was, you see at the bottom, a 46 degree control. The other one was 51 degrees. And um, cycle four is greatly diminished, but not quite. Cycle four is a little bit higher than cycle two. So, um, just changing the temperature by a few degrees and the control had a big impact. So looking back at the entire label release experiment, my father says it's produced positive response when uh, you put in the regular nutrient and it looks just like many tests we've seen on Earth. The Mars curve looks very similar. And 160 degrees centigrade absolutely knocks out the reaction, whatever it is. And uh, heating it to 50 degrees knocks out 90% of the reaction. Heating it to 46 degrees knocks out 70%, leaving 30%. And uh, leaving it in the hopper, in the storage unit, for two months absolutely knocked it out. And uh, they retrieved soil from under the rock and whatever was the active agent was not caused by ultraviolet exposure because the soil from underneath the rock reacted just as positively as any other. And um, number seven there is to say that even though adding extra nutrient didn't cause any extra gas to appear, uh, adding so much uh, extra water probably just caused uh, CO2 to absorb. In back in like into carbonic acids like soda pop. On Earth, um, the closest response is from Antarctic rock uh, scrapings, and what I'm told is that uh, it's like a mil. These uh, scrapings from Antarctica have algae in them about a millimeter below the surface. And, uh, and a very low concentration of organisms, but they actually have photosynthesis because 
um, they're close enough to the surface of the rock to see the sunlight, you know, less than a millimeter away from the surface. So this is uh, Antarctic soil that looks closest to the response from the Viking lander. These are a whole wide variety of responses from all over the world, and the Mars response is pretty much in the middle of it. Uh, and the, all the controls are way at the bottom, which are not shown here. But, uh, so we go, we've gone on since Viking, and uh, there are many subsequent experiments from Pathfinder and um, uh, what do you call it? Opportunity and Spirit and Mars, Polar, Lander. I guess there have been five successful landings after Viking. So um, one of them, I guess this is a Viking experiment uh, shown here, and it shows that ordinary uh, soil has a lot of magnetic particles in it, and um, that is metallic iron, whereas uh, the red planet is thought to be rust, or iron oxide, Fe2O3. But the fact that the soil has a large fraction of uh, metallic iron means that the soil is not that heavily oxidizing like um, this hydrogen peroxide that was, was hypothesized. The gas exchange experiment reported a burst of oxygen in that encouraged NASA to think that there was some very highly oxidizing material. Same thing happened later on uh, Pathfinder when they took uh, the Moss Power Spectrum and they're looking for um, different phases of iron, uh, triple, op triple uh, valence iron is, um, is more heavily oxidized than double valence, but both valences are seen, so this is not an extremely oxidized soil sample. And uh, this is, uh, I'm trying to remember which probe this is, but this is after Viking. And I think it's uh, Curiosity. It says it's Curiosity. Curiosity. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, they are heating up the soil slowly, and uh, it reaches 800 degrees eventually. And they're looking at uh, different compounds that come out of the soil. And you see a lot of uh, water coming out well before 100 uh, degrees centigrade. Um, and actually, NASA has agreed that this experiment shows that there's about 3% water in the soil, uh, which is uh, not water of hydration, but it's actually loosely available water that organisms could, could use, but uh, Death Valley, for instance, only has 0.7% water, and there are plenty of microorganisms there. So um, my dad's been following this. If you go from uh, you know, the, the beginning of the experiment to Curiosity, uh, working on it for 50 years, and uh, he thinks that if you go through it and there's just a great deal of uh, information out there, and I guess it would be a good chance for me to say that there's guildlevin.com with, with every uh, research paper my father has ever done, uh, and uh, not just about Mars, but mostly. Uh, over that time, I mean, it's a peer review moment. He has convinced the following uh, people, including myself, that he had found a microbial life on Mars with the label release experiment. And then there are more scientists who aren't absolutely sure, but who think he might have. It's possible. And uh, some of them even work for NASA. At any rate, the labeled release compounds were all mixed together because uh, they didn't want to have a complex instrument. They were just taking one shot 
they put in a spectrum of different uh, media that um, they thought would cover the territory and make sure that any particular bacteria would find something. But my father is very sad that he did not insist on them separating the chiral isotopes, uh, isomers, excuse me. Um, there are many molecules that are uh, symmetric, that you could look at them in the mirror and they'd be the same, like carbon dioxide. But there are many other slightly more complicated molecules that the mirror image is, is not the same as the molecule itself. And it turns out, probably by some point toss in our evolution, that all life we have ever seen uses right-handed sugars and left-handed amino acids. And uh, there are no exceptions. So in many experiments that were done on Earth, you can put down right-handed forming, excuse me, right-handed uh, glucose, and it will instantly react, as you've seen in these curves. But if you put down left-handed glucose, the organisms won't touch it. So uh, if, uh, instead of, or maybe with the control, if they had sent a spacecraft that had separate uh, pieces of soil with right and left-handed media, and if they really are related to Earth organisms, only the right-handed ones would react. And it would be very hard for anybody to hypothesize some sort of chemical that, or why a chemical would have a distribution that only attacked the right-handed and not the left-handed molecules, unless it were also related to biology. Because biology took that random coin toss from many billions of years ago and replicated it, that same choice was replicated to all the life we know about. So, um, and actually if you want to get, uh, if you want to make left-handed glucose, you make uh, random glucose in a chemical laboratory, then you have biological organisms eat away the right-handed. It's, it's very difficult to, without biology or a chemistry laboratory with uh, intelligence behind it, to prefer one mirror image molecule over the other. So my father designed a thing that looks like a little dart, and it, uh, it can piggyback off of somebody else's lander, and it shoots away a small distance, and uh, soil goes into two different test chambers, and they radio back over to the main spacecraft the radioactive results. Three minutes. And, uh, and we're just trying like the Dickens to get this uh, modified version of the labeled release experiment sent to Mars. And uh, you know, NASA has been avoiding directly looking for living organisms since 1976. They shouldn't be so shy. <laughs>
something like the uh, GCMS experiment, they got similar results. Uh, that's that's something that happened. I guess what was it? The Mars Polar Lander found uh, these it was, that disappeared. You mean Phoenix? Phoenix, right? I'm sorry. And uh, there's a big problem because. This meteorites are coming in. There's certainly a level of organics that are supposed to be there, even if there's nothing alive. And it should have been picked up. Organics of some kind should have been picked up by the GCMS. Uh, perchlorates, I guess, are a harsh chemical. But I don't think that they get through the sieve. That is to say, I don't think they're destroyed by the heat sterilization. Uh, in the way that the active agent was here. But uh, it also turns out that a lot of soils need to really be heated to get, there's a lot of organics that are very heavy. This uh, GCMS may not have gotten them out of the soil, uh, but you're right. I guess, you know, a uh, very harsh chemical like perchlorate could, could break down organics. But uh, I don't think it's, you know, in extreme life, I don't think it's enough to kill off organisms. And I don't think it's enough to fool the experiment. And I'm sure perchlorates have been run through. You know, if you think that perchlorates are causing this response, or <coughs> if you're hypothesizing that, I don't think, I don't think perchlorates meet the controls that, um, that Viking went through. That'll have to be the last word. Okay. Thank you.